talking about vision. And vision has a very special quality to it. Vision does not integrate. We're habituated to thinking that someone who can see in a broad way must be able to integrate very precisely. And this is true. But seeing broadly is not at all in the process of being able to see integrally. The integral seeing precedes the ability to conceive wildly, widely and wildly. You cannot get the cart before the horse. Perception precedes conception. You have to see something before you can think about it. Now you can have all kinds of fancy exceptions that you can see something that doesn't exist in your mind, like a centaur, and that's fine. The basic principle is that perception precedes conception. And just as perception precedes conception, conception itself precedes vision. You cannot see broadly until you have an idea, a conception, through which to prismatically see widely. That is very simple. It's an ABC. But it's ignored almost characteristically. And so the problem that we have in education, or in personal life, or in improvement, whatever it is, is constantly at loggerheads because of the confusion of a phase process which must be accurate, it must be articulated in order to be real, in order for the effects to be felt. So that perception has to come first, then conception, and then vision. And that the vision process is a wide seeing, and this whole simple hand gesture shows that when you see in a visionary way, you're looking out increasingly in a differential mode. Vision is differential, not integral. They're completely different. An integration comes in, a differentiation goes out. Breathing in, breathing out. And it's true that we need both in order to complete a cycle. But nevertheless, they are distinct. And that phases, which are necessary and characteristic of integration, do not work in differentiation. And the attempt to force differentiation to function as some kind of parallel to integration is what causes the ignorance in the world. Now, 2,529 years ago, to be precise, 2,529 years ago, a young genius in India named Siddhartha sat down for the first time and delivered a sermon about ignorance in the world. And he said, there is a series of interlocking steps. And these interlocking steps are 12 in number. And these 12 interlocking steps keep man ignorant. Not only make us ignorant, but keep us imprisoned in ignorance. He called the ecology of those 12 steps in Sanskrit, in the Magadhi 
dialect of Sanskrit, which uh, Siddhartha spoke. It was called Pratitya Samudpada. Dependent origination. And that the beginnings of the imprisonment of illusion are ignorance. Ignorance. And the tap root of ignorance is that integration is a totally different energy motion from differentiation. And by trying to force consciousness to function as if it were another version of perception allows for a whole cloak of flaws to clothe itself upon ourselves so that we never get to know who we really are. We never get to know who anybody else really is. And we have no way for our actions, our activities, to have an effectual application in realms that are surreal to the natural world. What are those realms? Vision, art, history, and science. Because vision, art, history, and science all belong to the differential mode of energy. They belong to the realm of consciousness. And they're real in consciousness. But no one is ever going to deal with the ecology of those phases of that realm. No one is ever going to deal with consciousness by forcing one's operative mode to be an imitation of the integral cycle. Now this problem was a problem that was seen conclusively at the time, 2,500 years ago. It was understood to the nth degree, and not just the historical Buddha, but in places like China, Lao Tzu, in places like Greece, Pythagoras, and Plato, so that about 2,500 years ago, in scattered oases of high insight and intelligence on this planet, there were individuals who faced this situation and came up with working solutions. Part of the difficulty of those solutions was that while you could teach one person, maybe, or a few people or under very limited special circumstances, a number of people, you could not teach a general population. And so mankind as a whole remained enmeshed in ignorance. And for about 500 years, a very small elite minority of men and women who did understand, tried to find some working way to apply it, especially in an education mode, so that large numbers of men and women could be brought into a more realistic working procedure and process. Now, in the West, and the West is everything from Ireland to India, in the West, the situation was exacerbated. In the West, about the time that the large-scale industrial-sized models of application were being made, that is to say about 300 years uh, after uh, Pythagoras, around the middle of the second century BC, at that time in the West, when the cream of men and women were trying to find ways to apply to educational procedures the lessons they had learned about differential consciousness to bring a large number of people into that fold, the world situation, the public situation, became increasingly skewed towards a contest between vying powers and eventually, after about 150 years, one 
of the powers emerged triumphant, and that was Rome. By 30 BC, Rome had achieved universal power in the West. And I mean everything from Ireland to India. It was more than simply beefcake muscle. It was filled with portents and omens. When Octavian was putting together his power and getting his um, uh, social structures in order, his main tap line to the right to that power was that he was the chosen inheritor of Julius Caesar. He was also in the Caesar family. And that he was the adopted son of his uncle, Julius Caesar. And that Julius Caesar really was a god, and therefore Augustus had been adopted by a god. And though Augustus never claimed to be divine himself, he claimed to be the son of a god. All of the major monuments in Rome at that time all have a very peculiar kind of iconography. They all say, none of them say divine Augustus, divine Octavian. None of them, not one. But all of the power ones say divine Julius. <laughs> Divus Julius. Divine Julius. And wouldn't you know that just as uh, Augustus was making a temple to his godfather, that's where the mafia term comes from. Hey? Hey! It comes from Julius Caesar. He's the original godfather whose authority is unquestioned because it's divine. Do you get it? Divine meaning eternal. There's no way to abrogate it ever, so why try? And that if you cooperate with it, you participate in an incontrovertible power that's eternal. That's when Rome began to be called the eternal city. That's what the church today calls it, the eternal city. And they mean it. When Augustus was raising this temple to his godfather, to the divine Julius, with the pillars and the statue of Julius Caesar in the center, and out on the side, the very altar, on which the body of Caesar had been burned by Mark Anthony, and under that altar, the very body of Julius Caesar, wouldn't you just know that in the sky appeared an enormous comet? 27 BC, an enormous comet. And what it signaled, I mean, you didn't see the comet tail so much. If you'd had a telescope, you could have. But what you saw was a huge new star. And so right on the pediment of the divine Julius temple in the center of the Roman forum, in that pediment was a huge star. And the new star signaling the confirmation of the Son of God was cinched in 27 BC in Rome. Can you hear this? This is not Christian church theology. This is Roman occult politics. Now, one of the uh, peculiar things that we're getting at here, and we're getting at something here, is that this was the public scene, but that Romans lived a double life. As early as the middle of the second century, they began, the wealthy, powerful Romans began to develop country houses into what became known as villas. And in those villas, all of the decoration has a very special, limited, peculiar quality. The walls of all of the rooms in those villas are filled with architectural perspectives. Paintings of more columns, more buildings, more arcades, 
more geometric forms, and they are all Greek architecture. They are not Roman architecture. They are Greek architecture. It's just like all the ancient architectural terms for a synagogue are Greek and not Hebrew. Why is that? Because there were no synagogues before Hellenistic Judaism. There was the temple in Jerusalem, and that was it. There were no branch office franchises. That's a Hellenistic Greek idea. Can you understand? Hey, as they say. We're talking about structures that make the world real, and they're deeply flawed. And to adjust yourself to a flawed world is a fool's game. It's the height of ignorance, and that's another aspect that we're talking about today. And we're talking about it because consciousness simply does not work. It shorts out. It short circuits. It flats out. It doesn't happen. If you force consciousness to be an imitation, of an integration process, especially one that's already deeply flawed. Now, the typical Roman of the first century BC lived a double life. He lived a public life in Rome, according, and he spoke Latin, and he obeyed Latin laws, and when he got fed up with it, he went out to the country, to his villa, and he lived in a Greek Hellenistic world. The statues in his villa were Greek philosophers. The books he read were Greek classics. The walls were painted with all this Greek architectural perspective. And if one were to resurrect in a very real way the archetypal spirit of the private Roman psyche, you would come up with something like Raphael's painting of the School of Athens, one of the greatest paintings of the Renaissance. That's what the ideal interior of the Roman mind looked like. That was the spiritual heaven. That was the uh, recourse from this stupid world of civil wars, of power politics, of overwhelming laws, of overpowering roads of legions without end, of war that is unceasing, of power that grows until it is held completely only by one man. The double world of the Roman personality by the time of Augustus had reached a schizophrenic breaking point. I have to use 1930s psychological terminology because it was that brutal. The Roman mind broke down. The last Roman Republican hero was Mark Anthony. And to paraphrase a sentence that Ezra Pound said of James Joyce, he was electrocuted by divine fire. He was an ordinary good man who couldn't handle divine energy when he plugged himself in. It's like trying to grab live wires of 10,000 volts. There's no way you don't get frazzed. No way at all. And the live wire he grabbed was Cleopatra. Now it's one thing for a man who can hold godship like Julius Caesar to play with an adolescent girl. Cleopatra was about 15 when he was around. It's a whole other thing when she is mature and she has her archetypal energy working. And she grabs you and says, you're going to make our dreams come true. I'm the last real ruler in the lineage of Alexander the Great who had the original power vision. And the proof of it is that in your private life, in your heaven, in your philosophy, in your culture, in your art, in your vision, in your science, in your history. You dream 
of a heaven that is Greek and not Roman and Alexander the Great was the great apotheosis of that Greek world power vision. And Cleopatra said, I am the true inheritor of that, and she was. She was exactly in a direct line from the original Ptolemy. Close friend and general, general of Alexander the Great, who cemented his power by marching into Syria and taking the body of Alexander the Great, uh, along with its uh, huge uh, uh, cart, gold plated cart with wheels taller than the height of a man. And instead of letting that cart go back to Macedonia, he took it into Egypt. And Ptolemy Soter. Ptolemy the Savior planted Alexander the Great's body in Memphis to show that their Hellenistic power not only comes from the Greek lineage, but it also comes from the archetypal Egyptian lineage. That Alexander the Great was a god, and Ptolemy Soter did the very same thing that Augustus would do 300 years later, almost to the day. He said, I am not a god, but I certainly have the authority from a god, and here's the god. Not buried under the ground, not buried in a pyramid, but displayed in a solid gold coffin with a glass bubble top so that you could go in and you could see the body of Alexander the Great. The same thing was done by the communists. The body of Lenin, preserved to this day, it's still there. Now you can topple all the statues of Lenin, but until the body is removed, the archetype is still plugged in. And so when Augustus Caesar defeated Cleopatra's archetypal strategy, he was very quick, very sure, very wise. He said, don't touch her. No one kill her. No one jeopardize her. Leave her alone. Isolate her. Cut her off. Nobody has contact with her. She is not to be touched. She cannot be touched. She must kill herself and in that whole lineage which he did. He was masterful. He was absolutely masterful at the power game. There isn't anybody that's been more masterful than Augustus Caesar. Octavian got the name Augustus because he set the first workable application prototype. The Hellenistic kings we're just model makers compared to the industrial genius. The Hellenistic kingdoms are just sketches towards the Roman Empire, which is the industrial working thing. It's not a model at all. The Roman Empire is the general motors of which the Hellenistic kingdoms were like the little experimental uh, garage mechanics trying to put together early cars in the 1800s. And in order to make sure that no one ever again would challenge his power, Augustus, who had spent a night alone in the building that housed the body of Alexander the Great, in the center of Alexander, it was called the Sema. The name means body, Sema. The building was called the body <laughs> because that's the only reality that was there. You went in, and in this huge, enormous canopy of open domed space was only one object, the gold coffin covered with glass bubble of Alexander the Great. Why was it gold? Because sarcophaguses are usually made out of limestone. But wait a minute. If you know languages, if you know what's going on, sarcophagus, it means body eater. When you put a human body 
into a limestone sarcophagus, the limestone absorbs, it eats away the flesh, the bones, it leaves nothing. Now, if you have gold fillings, the gold fillings will be there in the sarcophagus after several hundred years. To the ancient Egyptians, this was the proof of transcendence. The physical body evaporated from this world and materialized in the next. And the empty sarcophagus was the proof, it was the demonstration that this had happened. But Alexander's body in a gold coffin, mummified, never disappeared from this world. It was rooted here in this world. It was still powerful in this world. And so Augustus Caesar in 30 BC, having spent a night alone, he was the only person in the whole building. He later on would have his great friend uh, who was a genius, a military genius and an architectural genius, a man named Agrippa. He built a building in Rome called the Pantheon, which is very much built on the same principles as the Sema. And Augustus had the Pantheon built. It's still there. The Pantheon is the archetype for St. Peter's in the Vatican, which is in Rome also. The Pantheon, all gods. Notice the conversion from one god to all gods. Augustus spending the night in the Sema alone actually touched the nose of Alexander the Great's mummy and broke off the tip of it. And later on, three years later in 27 BC, when he was dedicating divine Julius's temple in Rome, he remembered that the only competition is in Alexandria, is the Sema, the body of Alexander the Great. And so very quietly, you don't find it in any records. There are no contemporary historians that even mention it. He had the body of Alexander the Great moved from Alexandria in a most appropriate way. Augustus was, if anything, a consummate power broker. He didn't have the body burned. He didn't have it uh, uh, desecrated in any way. But he had it moved out into the Sahara Desert about 200 miles to an oasis called Siwa because that's the place Alexander had gone to get his godship confirmed in the first place. And so Alexander the Great's body was put into a place that very few people would ever get to and buried and left for the sand to go over it. And then because not only Alexandria, but all of the province of Egypt was a personal possession of Augustus Caesar. I want you to hear it really closely. He personally owned Egypt. It didn't belong to the Senate and the Roman people. SPQR. The Senate and the, and the Roman people, they, they were the true owners of the Roman Empire, not Egypt. It was the personal property of Augustus. And so he simply commanded that Siwa be made a penal colony. And Siwa became a place of reprobation. Not only was it out in the Sahara Desert, very difficult to get to, but it became a criminal place. It became the uh, uh, sort of the devil's island of the Roman Empire. You would not go there for anything. And Siwa today still has that negative energy, absolutely brutal negative energy. And last week they found the site of the uh, burial of Alexander the Great. And the very next day it was denied. No, we, it, was, it was wrong because obviously Alexander died 300 BC and this, this tomb is, uh, is from a couple hundred years later. It can't possibly be that. Well, but it is. What's the point here? The point is we are living still out of the borrowed clothes 
of that whole power struggle vision. We don't own one damn thing that we're wearing, especially in our minds. And it's time to change that. And it takes a redoing of those kinds of complications and allowing for that freed up energy to be put into a pr process, a procedure, which really is natural to it and is operative to it. But note the problem is exacerbated by Augustus Caesar. He doesn't make the problem. It was there already. And the solutions to the problem predate Augustus Caesar by at least 500 years. The solution of Pythagoras and Plato, the, the solution of the Buddha, the solution of Lao Tzu, they are all workable. Each of those three, and there are others, work. But no one ever found a way to have them work for more than just one person at a time or a few people at a time. An isolated community of men and women who would devote themselves to this could, after some long while, achieve the purity of a community. But there was never any way to put the application to general society, to general life, because the problem became exacerbated by the double life led under Roman power, public and private, completely different. And so one can take men and women all through the last 2,000 years, you can take them out of the social situation and isolate them in monasteries or in nunneries, isolate them even in prisons, isolate them in their imaginative creativeness, isolate them in their art, and they will achieve wholeness but at the price that they cannot come back into life because they find themselves refined away so that they can't even stand to eat the food. They have no way to interface with the kind of brutalized personalities that parade around. And so it's a The problem has become chronic because the way computers work is an indelible version of the Roman power. <clears throat> it codifies methodically the flaws of ignorance so that one does not even understand that everything that one sees, dreams of, expects, could possibly, even in the wildest fantasy, conjure up, belongs to a bad dream. The key to it, the key to it, is memory. That memory is the little tab sticking out that wasn't folded into the fabric. It's a little flaw in the suit. And as soon as you pull on that little tab, the whole suit begins to unravel. The whole thing about, oh, we're going to have fantastic future with CD-ROM. Read only memory. Or my computer has so many hundreds of RAM, R-A-M. The M in this case is memory. And whether it's read only memory or random access memory, it all works on an algorithmic procedure. Let's get real clear. This is a book published by Oxford University Press in 1980, 
7. It's called The Mathematics of Plato's Academy, A New Reconstruction. It's in a series that Oxford uh, puts out on mathematics. And here we have in the introduction a very interesting kind of illumination. Let me just read this paragraph so that we can put ourselves in the driver's seat and then we'll take a break. The subject matter is early Greek mathematics, a phrase I shall use to denote the phase of developments that culminates in the works of Euclid and Archimedes. Euclid uh, wrote the first textbook on geometry in Alexandria, about the time of Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second Ptolemy. Archimedes was famous for putting the screw on things. That is, he discovered a, a, a process uh, uh, which led to some very interesting uh, engineering applications. I'm, I'm toying with it. I have to have some fun. I mean, if you can't laugh at the devil, who are you going to laugh at? Part 1, chapters 1 to 5, sets out in some detail an exploration of some mathematical topics suggested by ideas found in the works of Plato, Aristotle, Euclid, and Archimedes, and carried out using methods derived from their procedures. And it proposes that similar investigations might indeed have taken place and had some influence on the development of early Greek mathematics. And indeed, there were places like Alexandria and Pergamum and places where there were literate men and women who understood these issues, who dealt with them very realistically and mightily, and came to the kinds of realizations that are very useful. It is true. The main theme, though, <clears throat> not in its treatment here, is well known as mathematicians' jargon expresses it. It has been extensively studied since the 17th century, because indeed, in the 1600s, in the late 1600s, all of these issues came up again. All of them. Every single one of them. This is why at the very close of the 17th century, of the 1600s, you have two figures, Isaac Newton, and GWF Leibniz, who cement and codify a replay of what happened in Hellenistic times around the third century of the Common Era, third, third century AD. So that what we're talking about here has a very interesting history, has a very interesting career, and it's like one of these bad cycles, which the often quoted George Santayana said, those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. But it's an unfortunate misapplication. Santayana's English is uh, gorgeous and fantastic, his philosophic acumen unquestioned, but it isn't that history repeats itself, it's that ritual repeats itself, and those who do not learn are condemned to repeat that. Because it turns out that history is a differential process and has a built-in Archimedes screw, which develops and one does learn from that. But one does not learn from ritual. Let's say it again. Remember one of those Howard Hawks films where Walter Brennan is trying to speak to John Wayne and he has this false teeth in and he says, you didn't hear me too good. He said, let me say it again for your ears. Mr. Dunstan, I think it was Red River. He said, you heard me real good that time, didn't you? History is a differential energy, not an integral energy. History doesn't integrate. There's no way to put it together. No one puts history together. That's not how it works. That's not how it happens. It's a pattern that unfolds. In order to make it work, one has to unfold it, not pull it together. And that's one of the basic flaws of the Caesar system of the Roman Empire. 
It tries to pull history together and knot it once and for all. And life doesn't work that way. Historical life does not work when you knot it together. It backs up energy into swampy, never-never lands where nobody gets away without falling ill to the pestilence and the disease that comes out of that. History has to unfold to work, not be knotted together in some kind of power. It's extraneous of how much power you have or whether it's right. It's extraneous. It doesn't apply. So since the 17th century, all these issues that were studied again, and indeed they were studied very, very uh, specifically by Newton and Leibniz. Newton, after he wrote the Principia Mathematica and realized what he had got a hold of, spent the last 30 years of his life looking at the visions of the book of Revelation and of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and trying to put those visions together. He knew that the secret of man's mind vis-a-vis -vis the cosmos has something to do with these catastrophically important archetypal visions. Especially the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of St. John, and the book of Daniel. That somehow Daniel and the apocalypse, somehow they fit together. And when they fit together, they deliver what neither one alone will disclose, that the two of them together make a complete ecology of a radical archetypal vision that cures ignorance once and for all. Newton spent 30 years on it. He could never quite get it. He could never resolve it. And it bothered him mightily because someone who has the intelligence of a Sir Isaac Newton also has that kind of arrogance. If anyone can do it, I can do it. What he couldn't see was that the very structure of his mind had a bifurcation of the public and private dimensions, which led to a flawed context of the whole operation. And the only man in the world at that time who could understand it was Leibniz. And Leibniz tried to say in letters to Newton, you're almost there, but you're getting in your own way. And while Newton had access to the avenues of worldly power, he was the master of the mint in London. I mean, that is real world power. Leibniz was stuck in a fourth-rate library in a little tiny town in Germany and never let out. And what was peculiar is that the whole process of the way in which history was unfolding, the royal patron of Leibniz became the King of England. And by all accounts, he should have taken the number one royal tutor with him. And had Leibniz and Newton been able to become friends and work it out, the 18th century would have been truly an enlightenment. It would have been spectacular. It would have been colossal. Because while you had fantastic meetings like Voltaire and Franklin, and they and wonderful things came out of that, the United States and the French Revolution came out of Voltaire and Franklin seeing each other eye to eye, had Leibniz and Newton seen eye to eye, we would have had a lot of the resolutions of the 20th, late 20th century in the early 1700s, and we would have sidestepped an enormous nightmare which history has become since then. Because separating science from religion has led to an apocalyptic, stagnant, opposition that will electrocute everyone if it isn't resolved. The Nazis, the Soviets were sketches, simply sketches, of the kind of flawed 
technological tyranny that's on the horizon. They were very, very poor droodlers compared to what's coming unless it doesn't happen. This is a very real issue. Has nothing to do with selling million copies of some book being some kind of advertised guru for the weekend set. Has nothing to do with that at all. Has everything to do with what's real. Here is the last of that paragraph. Every mathematician knows the algorithm which generates the greatest common factor of two numbers. When you have a disparate, how do you resolve them? By a common factor, a resolving third. How do you do that? By the process of an algorithm. At each step, we subtract the smaller as many times as possible from the larger to remain, to leave a still re smaller remainder. So you take the larger number and you take the smaller one, you subtract it. And if it'll go again, you subtract it again. Whatever is left, common factor. When the procedure terminates, the last non-zero remainder is the greatest common factor. The flaw is that it's a non-zero. You would be a very, very poor yogi if you didn't come up empty in realization. Let's take a break. Let's come back to the last point, which was not made sufficiently in time for it to record on these instruments. I'm trying to culminate for you a whole gestalt, a pattern. And the pattern that I'm trying to culminate for you is that the process of vision is not at all what one immediately would expect it to be. Nor is it at all what one would want it to be on an intellectual level either. And this is what throws us. We're used to understanding that this world has deceptive appearances. But we're in a very uncomfortable, uncomfortable position to self-suspect our own mental processes. It's one thing to say that the world is flawed or that it's bad or even just on the, uh, the level that it's in bad taste. They're boors. <laughs> God knows they're boors. That's why he's not serving. No dessert. And no soup. But what is really difficult to come to terms with is that the whole mental context within which and out of which we're used to seeing and to conceiving has been compromised. Not because of the Gnostic conviction that the universe itself is flawed. The actual demonstrable realization is that the universe itself is real. It contains perfection and flaws ambidextrously. We can count on its being real. It is not unreal. But by the same token, we can also count on the fact that unreality doesn't really happen. That is a very, very profound. And one has to sort of cherish that. You can't grab it, but you can cherish that. That the real is real and the unreal is unreal. Those 
two paired, notice they're paired, those two paired insights or conclusions, they function both as insights and as conclusions. <clears throat> that pair occurred to the historical Buddha also. And that's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. Suffering is real. But because suffering is real, the cure to suffering must be equally real. And if suffering is real and the cure to suffering is real, there must be a real method by which one can find the cure. And then the fourth noble truth is that here it is. Now in the Greek language world, there was no Buddha. There was no enlightened one. But there were a whole succession of brilliant men and women who lived within just one or two generations of each other. And their accumulated genius was equal to that of the Buddha. And one of the most mysterious of all the figures in this succession, this tightly packed succession of individuals in the Greek language world, was from a very strange kind of a Greek city, Ilya had a reputation like in the United States, Missouri used to have a represent, uh, reputation. They're not going to believe anything until they, you show them. And even then, they're going to question. The individual's name was Parmenides. And Parmenides, when he grasped at his particular phase of this unfoldment, of this realization, this conclusion. When he grasped it, he wrote a mystical poem which is still extant. We still have it. And it was called The Way of Parmenides, and it's like a Greek version of Taoism. And the way I was taught about 35 years ago at the University of Wisconsin, the way I first heard it, Chairman of the philosophy department at that time was a guy named Bill Hay, William Hay. And I never forget the lecture that we heard it in. It was indelible because he, he got interrupted about two thirds of the way through the lecture. He was lecturing, and we were in one of the venerable old buildings at Madison, Bascom Hall. About 70 of us in this philosophy class are all taking notes. And Suddenly he stopped, and he was like this. And we thought, oh, what, what happened? He blow a fuse? Look at him. He was gaped, and he was looking up, and, and pretty soon, look up, and there, one of these beams going across the hall was a little sparrow that had somehow got in and was looking at Professor Hay just looking at him, and Hay gulped, and he looked down, and he was, it was like a little boy, and he said, Plato would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and the very next thing that he said was this, this little phrase about Parmenides. He said, Parmenides said that what is, is, and what isn't, isn't, and that they never meet, that they are a mutually exclusive disjunction, and they never meet. There's no resolution of that at all. What is, is. What isn't, isn't. Now what gets in the way is that there were many Greek thinkers who didn't take that as a real problem and found clever ways to get out of that conundrum. And those clever Greeks who begged the question, who ignored the real profound issue, who found cl 
clever ways to get around that were called sophists. Teachers that went around, they wore fantastic togas, up to date, they had all kinds of disciples, they had money, they had everything that the guru set has today. And what they offered were their clever solutions to showing that this is not a real problem. You can get around this. And the only person who took Parmenides' problem seriously, relentlessly, was Socrates. And the only student of Socrates that heard him really good was Plato. And in Plato's dialogues all the time, he's building up to the requirements of human character, the depth of consciousness that's necessary to steel yourself to get enough courage to face this disjunctive issue that what is, is, what isn't, isn't, and to come to terms with that. Not to cleverly get around it or try and resolve it by halfway measures. And when Plato got really good at the dialogue form, some of his later dialogues take this issue by the neck. And the two dialogues that sort of go together, they're almost like, you know, if you hold your hand up, these two fingers go together. They used to tell you, and, and uh, in World War II, they used to say, when you're smoking your lucky strike in bed, keep it between these two fingers because they won't, it won't fall out. Well, these two dialogues that hold the lucky strike together are the Theotetus and the Sophist. The Theotetus and the Sophist, they go together. The Sophist, the Sophist, is all about the fanciest of all the clever solutions of ignoring this disjunctive, exclusive, is and isn't. There's all the difference in the universe between one and zero. All the difference that there is, is there. And trying to get around it is a problem in knowledge. And so the Theotetus is about knowledge. The Sophist is about the false teachers of cleverness in place of knowledge. And those two dialogues go together. But they're very difficult to deal with. I think I had about 190 credits of philosophy in nine years of university. Yeah, I had to go nine years as a student. And then teach for 10 years on my own. No one ever presented the Theotetus and the Sophus together. They, they, in fact, they never uh, pre presented them uh, separately. <laughs> It was like one time a professor offered a course, a graduate course on Hegel, and he limited it to three people. And, and he said, well, well, wait a minute, nobody's ever taught Hegel. Why are you limiting it to three people? He said, well, I don't want to be overly criticized. Because <laughs> I, can't, I can't take it. <laughs> so when you offer something really cream, I mean, it gets down to such gut issues that people will, you know, they'll come after you. I remember a graduate seminar on Pythagoras in San Francisco State where one of the students got so irate. I mean, he slammed his books together and he stormed out of the room. I mean, there was this kind of embarrassed silence for about 10 minutes. And, and the professor, Mark Blum, a very good guy, he used to, this is the 60s, he used to be in his office with bare feet in this uh, galvanized wash tub full of cabbages and carrots, raw. <laughs> and he used to say, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting people used to the idea that the world isn't what it seems. <laughs> he, he finally, after about 10 minutes, you know, he said, he said, well, he said, the class is over. The guy stole all our energy. And it was true. It was true. There was, uh, nobody could say a thing. It was a well-dressed 
black guy in, in, in the 60s, everybody was sort of like, you know, humbly beseeching, you know, the well-dressed black guys, you know, well, you know, help us with our energy. Man. One of the big issues at that time in San Francisco was black consciousness. Yeah, you know about consciousness, man, but you don't know about black consciousness. And what's more, you can't. Well, that's a disjunctive, you see. There's no, there's no way. The only way that you can deal at all with that, if you deal with it, is to become clever and elusive and indecisive. And that's what happened to the Western mind. And it shows up in the late 1990s. In algorithmic planning for computer parallel processing. It's the exact place where it shows up again. We were reading this paragraph out of this Oxford science publication. It's not philosophy, science, mathematical series. The Mathematics of Plato's Academy, Fowler, D.H. Fowler, Mathematics Institute, University of Warwick, Coventry. Coventry is uh, not too far from Shakespeare's country. The conclusion that we didn't get on the tapes in the morning, we put there now. Every mathematician knows the algorithm which generates the greatest common factor of two numbers. At each step, we subtract the smaller as many times as possible from the larger to leave a still smaller remainder. When the procedure terminates, the last non-zero remainder is the greatest common factor. He goes on to say, what we shall mainly be studying, usually in the context of two line segments rather than two numbers, is the relationship between the two original qualities and the sequence of numbers that describes how many subtractions have been performed at each stage. The original pair of numbers or lines clearly determines this pattern of subtractions, but conversely, we may ask, what is it about the original pair that is determined by this pattern? Can the same pattern arise from two different pairs? And if so, how are they related? That issue was dealt with 2,500 years ago. Lecture notes in computer science, algorithms and data structures. Second workshop, Ottawa, Canada, August 1991. Page 92, a little abstract of an article, Memory Access in Models of Parallel Computation, From Folklore to Synergy and Beyond. Whoa, as they say in Van Nuys. And in Canada, too. Yeah, I taught in Canada for five years. Whenever we would hear the quote, hard-heeled Torontonians coming into the offices in Western Canada, everybody would say, here they come. <laughs> York University hotshots going to tell us how to run our schools. Parallel Random Access Machine, P-R-A-M, PRAM. Over the last few years, it has become increasingly obvious that parallel computers provide an opportunity for the efficient use of a memory system that is larger, faster, more cost-effective than its uniprocessor counterpart. This coupled with the realization that memory is indeed the costly part of a computer has been one of the main motivations behind the growing number of applications of parallelism to the solution of real problems. So just like in our education, memory is a 
key concern. In fact, one can say that in the architecture, in the arch of differentiation, memory is the keystone. The whole shape of the architecture of the process of differentiation is dependent upon the keystone function of memory being there. The saying 2,500 years ago, the Pythagorean saying, memory is the mother of muses. Okay, there are nine muses, but the order of the muses, that is to say the ordinal set of the muses, is capped by Apollo. The nine muses lead to a tenth place, which is Apollo, who brings the one and the zero and holds them parallel. Doesn't mix them, because they don't mix. Doesn't resolve them, they don't resolve. But they do hold as a pair. And ten becomes a magic number, because it holds as a pair. That presents, it doesn't represent, but it presents the disjunctiveness and preserves it just as so. You don't get a clever resolution. You don't even get a resolution, but you get a further unfolding because one can then use that as a base powers of 10. And that base functions as something real, though it isn't anything. So that ordinal powers work in consciousness because of this kind of function. So memory is very, very important. Not only the mother of the muses, but ensures that the Apollonian order of those kinds of sets of a power base, the powers of 10 in this case, holds. And not only does it hold in the mind, in consciousness, but one can apply that to the real world and the real world will filter through a distribution application into the forms made. So that one can not only think E equals mc squared, but you can make an atomic bomb by applying it to matter. So that the differential energy in the universe allows for one to take vision and apply it to the world, and the world will blossom in that way. It is very important. Because without that capacity, well, for just openers, love would never be real. It would never be possible for two distinct and separate beings to ever have a synergy, even though they do not become identical. But love is a synergy that is possible because their similarity transcends the problem of non-identity. And this is the whole thing that is cupped under the word transformation. Because a transformation happens, a radical change in structure is able to be put into play, applied, carried out and developed, we would say, I think the colloquial phrase, is that a cosmos is a universe of unlimited possibilities where the possibilities can become true. A universe is already there, but a cosmos is always in the making. A cosmos is a visionary universe and there can be as many dimensions and possibilities as, as ever needs be. There, are, there is no limitation to it whatsoever. Because its function in the real is precisely to be new. So the litmus test is not how somebody did it before. And that litmus test is known in, in philosophic circles for the last 200 years as the categorical imperative, courtesy of Immanuel Kant. 
before you do any act, you better ask the question, what if everybody did this? And when you think that through, you probably won't do that act. But on the other hand, is a completely differential option engendered by a French philosopher, Maurice Marleau Ponty, who called it the existential imperative. One must ask the question, what if no one did this? And very frequently the answer is the universe would be minus of value. So do it. And the phrase do it came out in the early 60s, courtesy of American and British readers of Merleau-Ponty. In, in, in Russia, uh, Voznesensky and Yevtushenko didn't say do it, they said da. Yevtushenko in San Francisco uh, uh, read in, in Russian one time this very great poem. And then it was read by Richard Wilbur in English about how there are two cities. One, the city of Nyet, and the other, the city of Da. <laughs> and how contemporary life at that time seemed to be that that people were scurrying back and forth as nomads and never quite getting, when they would approach Nyet, it would just be so offensive they wouldn't go there. And we, when they would approach Da, it would just recede and they could never get there. And he said, we're spending our whole lives just running back and forth between the cities of Da and the city of Nyet. It's this old problem of one and zero. It's this old problem that if you do not find a way to have a paired synergy operative as a possibility, the ignorance creeps in because you come up with ingenious, clever solutions that somebody else thought of and sold to you as an issue. And the Greek word for that was metaxu, in between, something in between. And it's the in between parts that are the selling point, because here's a new in-between. Aren't you ready to buy? A new, improved in-between. Your teeth are going to shine, and other appendages are going to be full, and you're just going to have fantastic time. And here's the short form chant for it. All you have to do is hum the initials of the words, and you get it. Sorry. Sorry. What do you say to Mother Nature? Con su permission, Señor. It's idiocy. It was idiocy then. It's idiocy now. Five times over. There's no way to deal with it. One of the conclusions that comes out of this, one of the conclusions that comes out of this, Algorithms and Data Structures, 1991, August. It has been known for some time that memory access is the key to the power of the pram. In this paper, we have exploited this power and pushed it further in three dimensions and three directions. Incidentally, uh, in the mathematics, uh, there is no way to have a resolution for dimensions greater than three. It doesn't resolve. It's like finding the square root of, uh, of uh, two. It just, it's endless. You can, uh, there's no exactness. Our first result was to show that two of the most fundamental beliefs in parallel computation, namely the speed up and slow down of theorems, are not universally true. Furthermore, we have exhibited the class of data movement intensive problems, which may be characterized as being inherently parallel, i.e inefficient to solve sequentially or with fewer than the maximum number, possible number of processors. This suggests two directions for further research. The study of data movement intensive problems is to be continued with the purpose of exhibiting other members and discovering additional properties of the class. And it should be interesting to investigate the validity of the two folk theorems 
for other models of parallel computation. Our second result was obtained by redefining the cost of a computation to include the cost of the um, IU linking processors, that is to say the interconnection unit, the IU. Here you have a processor, here you have an interconnection uh, unit, and here you have all the little um, shared memory locations. Now why are there little shared memory locations? Because the Roman art of memory says that you need these here for memory to operate. Where does it say that? Where is the Roman art of memory? It is specifically in only two volumes that have come down from antiquity. Both of them are by Cicero. The first one is almost never referred to, not even if you get a PhD in classical studies. Uh, De Inventione. Why? Because Cicero himself repudiated it because he said he wrote it when he was an adolescent. How old was he? He was about 16. But in the Middle Ages, people didn't know this. They forgot all about this. And all kinds of professional scholastics who were deadly serious about you learning their way called this the old rhetoric. This is the way that it's done. And if there's any improvement, the improvement is the new rhetoric, which is also by Cicero, written when he was about 20 years old, called, if it's in a letter to a man named Herennius, so it's called to Herennius, ad Herennium. And these two were always published together. In fact, the first Renaissance edition in the 1500s of the art of memory included both books together. They're both the works of an adolescent lawyer. They're not the works of somebody who's really sophisticated in philosophy, much less a wise man. I love the mature Cicero. I think it would make hell of a movie. The handsome Clarence Darrow of the Dying Republic, who was the only voice to be raised in opposition to Julius Caesar. And what did they do? They came and got him. You know what they did in those days? They cut his hands off, left the dead body in his villa, and nailed the dead hands to the podium in the Roman Senate to say, anybody else want to object to us? That's power politics. I love Cicero, but the adolescent Cicero hadn't even gotten Posidonius yet as, in, as his instructor. And no wonder he repudiated these words. And when you read them, it reads like a kind of a blocky litany that they teach, excuse me, they teach lawyers this in watered down fourth rate education. The first, when the issue in the case has been determined as well, to consider whether the case is simple or complex. Are there one question or two? In the second place, one must consider the, dis the dispute, whether dis the dispute turns on general reasoning or on written documents. Because if it's on written documents, then there has to be the issue of the letter and the intent, then if there are laws, the conflict of laws involved, the third with the words ambiguity, the fourth with reasoning by analogy, and the fifth with definition. And the whole thing then turns on logical proof in terms of written documents. And you have the foundation of the legal system that in turn is the skeleton for the political system that in turn is the umbrella in Aegis for the cultural application of wealth and investment and how education is going to be run and what's going to be done with it and what kind of clerks we need for our branch offices. The entire ensemble is flawed. It's not that those guys are wrong and these guys are right. 
It's not that the problem is in this area and this area is okay, but it's like one of these Mandelbrot sets. It's a fractal flaw that runs throughout the entire structure. Now, there are really high powered yogic ways that one could simply glass in the entire flawed fractal system and make a kind of a Dutch crackle glass glaze. But other than that, the only solution that seems to recommend itself is a better education. Because we have a whole heritage of men and women who all this time didn't buy this at all. They never lived by this. They lived by the wisdom that they were able to find because they're not only an alternate tradition, but the whole main structure of civilization has nothing to do with this. Nothing whatsoever to do with this. And from time to time, the basic quality is this. Integration, when it proceeds, according to the laws of integration, finally achieves a vanishing point. The Hindu name for it was Bindu. The uh, late the Sanskrit Mahayana term for it was Shunyata. The void, emptiness. Openness, no graven images. The soul by itself has no image. The Wallace Stevens' beautiful poem about the snowman, about how people talk about the good man has no face, as if they knew. That that zero is as real as the one. And they do function as an eternally disjunctive pair. But the emphasis is not on eternally disjunctive, but on the paredness. Just like we talked about two weeks ago, that when you liken a human being to a blank page, you get all the difference in the world, whether you emphasize the blankness or the pageness. Remember that lecture was the third lecture, vision three, called pageness. And what we did in pageness, if you were here, we took a blank page. We said, let's not argue with the Latin base scholastics, the tabula rasa roster, with the <laughs> Cartesian cogito ergo sums. Those sums of cogito. Oh. A blank page still takes folds, and you can get structure even though nothing's written on the page. It is a profound realization. Now, Plato's whole theory of education is based on recognition, recognition that memory does not function as some kind of imitation of sense, perception, categories, organize. The principle in ad herenium is loci et foci, place and image. And when you put the images, in their little cubbyhole places, then you can improve your memory. That's a mechanical distribution of an integral energy, which when transferred and applied in a differential energy, trims the wings of little angels and makes them worms. They can't fly anymore. William Blake has a beautiful illustration of that, of the, of the mature adults, the big round glasses and the big shears, trimming the wings of little children so that they will not fly away. 
We want you to stay where we put you. Vision, which is what our education is about right now, once vision happens, those children will fly away. Where are they going to fly to? Wherever they want to go. The saying in Athens, one of the accusations against Socrates, we have enough problem with you if we get a whole bunch of Socrates, the city's going to fall apart. And of course it would have. The city as they knew, the city of the tyranny of the 30, would have indeed fallen apart. They wouldn't have had a chance to do it. Because you can't carry an authoritarian dictatorship through when you have men and women that you have to ask each one whether they're going to go along with you or not, and each one has the right to say yes or no. It's like line item veto in the hands of the people. <laughs> and the word for that was democracy. Not aristocracy, not oligarchy, not tyranny, but democracy. That's what democracy was. That the people have the line item veto. And that you have to make sense to them all the time on every damn issue. Well, they have the right to say, well, not, not me. And it's very difficult to get everything cubed together when there are dozens, if not hundreds, if not millions of people who are saying, well, I don't think so. It's not going to work. So the only way compacting social power maintains itself is to keep this flawed structure operative. No, it's not a conspiracy. Nobody's that smart. But it is a tradition. It works, and so it's used. Our whole lecture today is about the fact that if you do not carry integration all the way through, deep enough, we talked one time about the angle of vision. Emerson used to like to use that kind of language, the angle of vision. If you do not teach men and women to carry their integration angle of vision deep enough into themselves to begin touching those mystical regions, those beyond places, those domains where fairy tales are real, where their visionary energies are touched and released and stirred, where the juices of their artistry, their own personal qualities, begin happening. If an education doesn't pay, uh, allow for an angle of vision to go that deep enough in integration, then you get this mataksu, you get this in-between. And on that in-between, instead of having the capacity for vision, you have only an imitation of it, which is called the ability to have an opinion. The Greek word for it was doxa. In the Protestant Reformation, one of the favorite songs that the Protestants sang was their doxology. Our doctrine, which we believe and they don't have, and out of that came the Thirty Years' War, if you can believe it, that killed a third of the population of Europe, more than the Black Plague ever did. Travelers at the end of the Thirty Years' War going through parts of Germany said they never found a living thing. Not only no people, but no birds, no dogs, nothing. And they didn't even have modern weapons, much less nuclear weapons. It's a problem too serious to be left to the planners. It's a misquote of Clemenson. War is too important to be left to the generals. He actually didn't say it, he mumbled it at Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
with all that white hair, he could mumble really well. The issue here in our education is that what we're looking at now is vision. And that vision comes after we had spent three months on symbols. And that symbols are the stage at which integration is brought to its highest, its most conclusive summation. Optimally, one would have an integration where the angle of vision would deep, be deep enough to actually touch the soul. This is what Plato said. Plato says, a real education touches you deep enough that you begin to remember things that you didn't know that you knew. <laughs> that you begin to recognize what things are and what they're for, and no one ever told you. Because the soul is eternal, it never has not been. That when you touch that power in yourself, you're able to tell what something completely new is without ever having seen it before and know what that does and decide how you're going to be with that. In Longfellow's uh, long forgotten, beautiful fairy tale epic of Hiawatha, when Hiawatha goes on his vision quest and he deepens himself and the boy Hiawatha becomes the man, he then goes and, and the trees tell him what they're good for. The birch tree says, my bark is good to make uh, the fastest canoes. And the flowers, the herbs, the animals tell him what they're good for. And the whole of nature works with Hiawatha. And he becomes like a differential shaman who rescues the whole people. Because he's someone whose soul is alive again. And the whole universe reports to the enlivened soul as a child would to its own parent. We're not some late product of evolution. We're founding members of the creation committee. What does the epistle to the Hebrews say about the difference between man and angels? He says angels are the messengers of the house. They're servants of the Lord, whereas human beings are family. We're not servants at all. Family. The angels work for us. It doesn't matter what kind of spaceship they come in. You have a right to look at their dossier and see how they're doing. This whole issue becomes of concern when we look at the two texts that we have. We have Jung's alchemical studies, which we're going to start looking at next week, which deals with the inner processes of transformation. And we have the art of memory, which deals with the whole rise of theater of drama, because theater and transformation go together. They're a pair. They work together. And there are times when theater and transformation are held in an Apollonian parallel. Individuals like Sophocles or Shakespeare would hold them with such equanimity that the continuity between the disjunctive pairs would occur, even though seemingly it's impossible in this world. In eternity, they flow just like a river. It's called the stream of light. And one discovers that what was impossible in this world, not even imaginable, is the ordinary familiar intelligence in heaven. And one stops being curtailed by the limitations of the prison. And as Plotinus says, the soul being freed at last, regaining its wings, 
flies home. So more next week. I'll make some copies, if you like, of this tape. Thank you.